What is up, Facebook land? Welcome to another episode of Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Max Kubler, and before I get to my special guest, Justin Shank, um, I got to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, always dedicate a show. Uh, this week, I'm dedicating the show to the Reading High School Boys Basketball Program, wearing their uh, state championship shirt from three years ago, signed by all the players, and uh, really enjoy working with that team and, and, and being a source of of inspiration um, for them. Um, so every year I get to go and talk to them. So this this podcast, since uh, Justin lives in Reading, he's doing his big speaking event, Reading. Um, we're going to dedicate the show to Reading. Um, can you hear me pretty well, Josh, or no? Do you hear me okay? I hear, I hear you great. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, a little bit, uh, podcast can be found pretty much anywhere, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, you know, you name it, it you can find it. Um, I also am doing sort of like a, um, a partnership with another podcast, a buddy of mine, Colin Thompson, who uh, played college football at Temple and uh, a couple years in the pros. He started a podcast, um, and I'm just trying to help him out to help grow his listeners. Um, so real quick, uh, if you're a sports fan and you have any interest in acquiring knowledge about the business side, tune in to the Business of Sports Insider podcast available on all platforms. Colin Thompson is the host, and he played college and professional football. Um, he felt there was a void in the coverage of sports from a business standpoint and off the playing field service perspective. He decided to gather his network of the NFL, college, athletics, front office members, financial advisors, media members, and player representatives to educate and remind fans of all sports that it is a business, in fact. So follow Business of Sports Insider on Twitter at the business O-F-F-S-I, so off-S-I. That's his Twitter handle. So. Um, a little bit about my man, Justin. He is a man on a mission. He is a podcast extraordinaire. Um, in 2018, he was rated uh, uh, top eight podcasters to watch. Um, he's been airing his podcast growth now movement all across the world in 100 countries um, every single week. And, and basically, he just helps people find ways to uh, be inspired and be uplifted to overcome adversities. And he shares great stories of people that are trying to um, do that. So without further ado, my man, Justin Shank. How are you, brother? Dude, I am so well. Like I said before, before this whole thing got weird and erased and different technology, <laughs> uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me on and, and repping Reading, which is uh, an exciting thing. And, you know, Lonnie Walker's finally getting some minutes, so that's pretty yep. cool. Um, but, yeah, man, I'm excited for the conversation and, and, you know, excited to go wherever you want to go. So, you know, obviously the, the low-hanging fruit is your podcast. Um, I think uh, – <laughs> We can start there because I think it's, it's important for people to know what it is you're about, what your show's about, why you have this platform. Um, so let's, let's take a little quick tour through the podcast of Growth Now Movement. Then we're going to go and we're going to find out who Justin Shank is and, and how he got to where he is today. Sure, man. So like you said in the introduction, um, you know, I host the podcast, uh, The Growth Now Movement. I started it almost three years ago at this point, which is crazy. Uh, and uh, at the end of 2017, Inc. Magazine listed me as a top eight podcast to follow. And, you know, things kind of started to get, get a little crazy from there. I've built a business out of it. I'm now a podcast coach and, and I run a production company. Um, and that's really what I do full time now. And I speak all over the country on, on podcasting and why brands should use it. You know, but it was a but it was a long journey. Like that didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen, um, you know, within the first year or even two years, you know, really. Uh, over the last year, everything really started to blow up. And now my podcast uh, ranks in the top 15% in the world. Um, and when you think about it, like it's, it's kind of crazy. I'm just some dude from Reading. But I think what happened was my intention uh, really fell in line with everything that I was trying to do. And that is just the understanding of it doesn't matter where you come from. What matters are the decisions you make today moving forward. And when that message started to resonate with the audience, Everything started to grow organically. And then again, you know, obviously the ink thing and a number of other places that I've been mentioned, it really helps. But at first it was the intention and finding the message and understanding what is the reason behind me doing this? Like, why am I even doing this? Um, and for me, it was just impacting the world to understand that we all have the same opportunity, but we have to make the right choices today to move forward into tomorrow. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I, when I started this journey for me of, of deciding how to grow my brand and do all that stuff. I did a lot of podcasts in 2018 as a guest. And, and I really, um, I had, had no idea what a podcast was, to be honest with you. I'd never listened yeah. to one. I'm not necessarily a, a guy that listens to self-help stuff. And so 
So I never really knew that there was a, even an industry out there as large as, as what podcasting is. I was a, you know, WIG guy. I listened to sports radio. So yeah. Um, when I when I finally got into that world, and I and I got on some really good um, podcasts, you know, with Chris Lockhead and John Broman and um, Tony Grebmeyer, and I, I really saw the value of growing it, any brand, not just mm-hmm. the speaking brand, through the platform of podcasting and um, not knowing what a download was, not knowing what a subscription was, not knowing what any of that was, I decided to venture into that. And yeah. um, I found it exponentially um, beneficial to my brand, to growing my message, to sharing um, other people's stories. So when I started my podcast, this was, you know, I'm, I'm kind of finding my way through it on purpose on my own. Um, yeah. that's, that's the way I like to do things, I like to discover, but um, having you on and, and having your knowledge and expertise on my show um, is going to obviously help me way more than it's going to help you. But um, <laughs> I do appreciate um, your time and, and coming on. So with yeah. that being said, let's go into the history of, of, of my man. Uh, you know, why are you you? Where did you come from? I know you're a South Jersey boy. You live in Reading yeah. now. Yeah. Um, let's, let's look at the, the early years of Justin. Because I don't know how many how many podcasts or interviews you've done, but I don't, I want to share with everybody why you are you, mm-hmm. and where you come from, and, and your values, and, and what sculpted you and molded you into the person you are today. Sure, man. You know, I, I like to say that if there was a senior superlative for least likely to succeed, uh, that would be me. You know, if I, if I rewound to my junior year of high school, I had a 1.7 GPA. Uh, at the time, my mom was in the middle of a 20-year opioid addiction, and my dad was in jail for, like, the most formative years of my life. And so all signs point it to things aren't going to work out for you, kid. Um, but I think for me, what I ended up doing at the age of 19, I got a job in direct sales and I did really well with the company. I actually met John Roman when I was 19 for the first time um, because of the, you know, working in the same company. But it gave me a taste of self-development. It gave me a taste of you can create a better life. You don't have to rely on the people around you um, to, to do that for you. And so it took me a long time to figure out what that even meant, you know, a lot of trial and error, just like you, you said you're trying to do with this podcast and what I've done with my podcast, you know, it was a lot of trial and error in life. Um, first, it was like, cool, I can climb the corporate ladder and I can be a businessman. Um, and I did that and I did well. Um, and, but at the same time, I, I didn't feel fulfilled. And I was reminded that when I was 20 years old, I was a manager with that, that direct sales company. And I was reminded of a moment where a kid came up to me and he said, you know, Justin, I say kid, but he was probably older than me at the time. Uh, but he came up to me and he's like, you know, Justin, if I worked at McDonald's this summer, I would have made more money. But because of the things you taught me, I'm able to live a better life and really kind of reach my goals. And that one sentence really resonated with me. And I go, that's it. That's what I need to do. That's, the, that's what's going to fulfill me in life. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily, I, I didn't need to make money doing it. It didn't have to be the business. And that's why I started the podcast um, because I was like, well, you know, let me, let me see if I can, you know, touch one or two lives. That was the goal. Like touch one or two lives, make some cool connections and see where it goes. Um, and it was supposed to be originally an entrepreneur podcast. Like how can we help young entrepreneurs figure out business? But five months before the podcast launched, my mom lost her 20 year battle to opioids. Mm. And, you know, when I got that call that nobody wants to hear, which is, you know, the doctor says you need to come. And I, I had to drive seven and a half hours because I was on vacation at the time. And it was the longest seven and a half hours of my life. And to go to walk into a scenario that I didn't know what it was going to look like or what that was, you know, I walked in the room and she was laying there and, you know, she was intubated and plugged into all the machines. Um, and the, the machines were keeping her alive at that point. And I walked in and I kind of said what I wanted to say to her. And that was, you know, she was a great mom, even though she had her own demon. She was an incredible mother and, and mom and nurturing and caring. And she was always my rock. And I told her these things. And I also said to her, you know, I'm going to make you proud. And I didn't know what that was. Um, I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so organically, the podcast became about overcoming adversity, not allowing your past dictate who you are. Those are the kinds of conversations I wanted to have with these super successful people to prove to other individuals that you don't need a perfect life to create a perfect life. You could make mistakes. You could hit rock bottoms. You could reach your goals and then hit rock bottom again. But it's about, you know, bouncing back. And, you know, it was my rock bottom moment that created the platform for what I do now, which is, 
you know, the podcast and speaking and, and now Growth Now Movement Live, which is insane that I'm able to do something like that. Um, but it was, I think there's so much power and I think you can attest to this. There's so much power in that rock bottom moment. Yeah, and I, you know, I, obviously we've, we've shared our stories together um, in the past and um, you know, I know how I handled my rock bottom, which is uh, not recommended um, to beat yourself up and slowly die inside for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your relationship with your mom and your dad. Let's, let's go back to your childhood and, and, you know, go through those, those moments where you were becoming more aware of the fact that you had a life that was not necessarily built for succeeding. So you're now, you know, you're in Jersey, right? You're in South Jersey, Ocean City area. Yeah. I grew up in Ocean City and then at 15 moved to like the Cherry Hill area. So your dad, let's talk about him a little bit. Cause you mentioned briefly that he was in jail. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Tell me about your dad. Yeah. So, so again, my parents, so here's the thing, here's what I'll tell you. My parents are incredible parents, right? Um, uh, they were amazing to me and my sisters. They really supported us. They, they were really the empowering part of me thinking that I can do some cool stuff, right? Because they they never told me what I should do with my life. They kind of just uh, supported me and cheered me along when I would try stupid stuff and businesses, you know, in, in my younger years and stuff like that. But, you know, my dad made mistakes and, and he ended up in, in prison. And, um, you know, I, I forgave him for that. But when he came out, he was kind of a jerk. And I didn't talk to my dad for seven and a half years, not because he went to jail, but because he was kind of a jerk. Um, and I think that that was the most empowering thing for me because at, you know, at, 18 years old, I think is when I made that decision at 18 years old, when you decide that, yeah, I'm not no longer talking to my dad, like the guy that growing up, I respected so much, like it was, it was tough. Right. Um, but me and my dad actually had a conversation about a year ago. Uh, we're, we're good now as the best man at his wedding. Like we're, we're very close, but we had a conversation and he said, you know, Justin, I missed you for those seven and a half years, but I'm glad that you made that decision because you broke a really bad cycle uh, that happened in our family for generations and also helped me understand a lot of things. And so I think sometimes it's okay to say goodbye and understand that you might learn some lessons along the way. So, I mean, that's kind of the dad thing. I, you know, I talked to my dad earlier today and, and, you know, again, we're super close. Um, but I was a mama's boy straight, like straight through life, man, you know, childhood. It was funny when I gave the eulogy at my mom's funeral, I had said, you know, I, I mentioned that I was a mama's boy and I kind of froze and I was like, oh, that's probably why I'm still single. Uh, and so kind of made a joke during that, but, but I was always super close with my mom and I was super supportive and loving and, uh, tried to help as best I could. But when you're a kid, no matter what, no matter if you're a 25 year old kid, a 30 year old kid, or, or a 12 year old kid, you're still the, the, the kid to that parent. Um, and so even though I, I was fully supported by her, you know, I did everything that I could to support her too. That's why I ended up in Reading. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to do best by her and everything that I do now, because that's what I did when I was alive too or when she was alive. So I want to talk about your, the, the choice you made not to talk to your dad, because I, I made a similar one mm -hmm. um, in 1996, 95, 96. Um, when my dad um, and I, my biological father and I stopped having communication, it was over a, a moment in, in over stupidity, but it was, it was the stupidest thing, but it was the thing that needed to happen for whatever yeah. reason. It was the thing that caused the end. Um, and I haven't seen my, or spoken to my father since 1996, and I, I made the choice that that's just not going to happen ever again, for many reasons. Um, more, most importantly, because he doesn't deserve my time, and he doesn't deserve the uh, doesn't he doesn't deserve to know my family, mm -hmm. and and they're better off not knowing him. Um, but when you made that decision, were you convict? Was your conviction in that you were intentionally on that at that moment when you made that decision to never talk to your dad again? Or was it a, I'm just taking a break from dad? You know, I didn't know. Um, I, it wasn't, I don't think it was the forever thing. I don't think that that was ever the goal, but it certainly said, I'm okay. I said to myself, I'm okay with forever. If the things don't change that need to change. Um, thank goodness they did. Uh, like I said, like my relationship with him is so strong now, but, um, but I, I don't think that it was, I was ready to accept forever, but that wasn't the intention, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I, the reason I asked that, because I, I made the decision right then and there, it was forever. Um, yeah. There, was, there wasn't any amount of, the damage of 25 years of my life was just, I was done. Yeah. So 
but and I was just curious when you made that choice because I think it's a it's a very clear when you say I'm not going to talk to my father anymore <laughs> I'm not going to have communication that that's a real thing and that yeah. that takes a level of um, hurt and disappointment to generate that decision and I, and I I think that's something that um, maybe a lot of people feel but never really acted on and I always yeah. like sharing those like when you had the moment when you said that's it like what was was there a defining moment was there a an action or, or a statement or a interaction with your dad to cause that? Yeah, there was. And I, I won't go into too many details just because it's not my story to tell. Right. Um, but, but, you know, there, there, there was. And so here's the thing that I learned, and this is probably the most empowering thing that I could have learned from that situation. When things go wrong in any relationship, whether that's father, son, mother, daughter, friendship, loving relationship, marriage, I think we need to look at both people in the party. You have to look at the person and, and, okay, why am I making these choices and what did they do? And you also have to look at yourself and say, how did I handle it? Did I do the right thing? Did I, you know, am I at fault as well? And so often we're not very good at self-reflecting. Um, and it was something at that age I wasn't good at. And I think in those seven and a half years, I learned it a little bit, but I've even learned that more even after we reconnected. Cause I look back and I went, well, I could have handled that in a much more mature manner. I could have had a conversation versus telling him to F off and then hang up the phone. You know, there's other things I could have done and handled differently. Um, now I'm not one for regrets. I think that everything happens for a reason. So I'm not going to go back and change that if I could. Uh, but at the same time, like we always have to look at ourselves because that's the only thing we have control over. That's in relationships. That's in business. That's in everything. We can't control other people. We can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we react to what happens to us. Um, I think that I would have made the same decision and not talked to him for a while, but I probably should have handled it differently. Um, and so when I approach anything now, whether that's a, you know, a business deal or a friendship, I always make sure that I'm in integrity um, to make sure that I'm serving myself first, because that's super important. And it sounds selfish when I say it like that, but there's actually a guy right over my shoulder right here. His name is Preston Smiles. Uh, and he says that I first must fill up my cup and whatever overflows is for everybody else. Because if his cup is empty, if my cup's empty, if your cup's empty, you're not giving enough to anybody else. You're nothing but a grumpy old man, right? And that's what I, dude, I was a grumpy old man at the age of 17, 18, 19. That's just the reality. Um, and I think when, when you start to self-reflect and you accept your faults, that's when the growth begins, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Now, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I applaud you for being able to reconnect with your father and and reconcile and have a relationship with him. I'll be honest with you. I wish I had that opportunity. Um, it just never presented itself. And, and I know my dad, um, unfortunately, and I just know that that, that will never happen. And, yeah. and it's sad. Um, but, but it's also God's will. And he, he, he controls that part for me. And uh, I, don't, I don't spend much time worrying about it. I mean, I, I obviously know it exists, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. So your mom, um, you know, I, I, Obviously, as a police officer, I'm very much in tune to the opioid crisis mm -hmm. and, and how that um, can affect families. How did um, you said you mentioned your sister? How did the the opioid component to your mom's uh, situation directly impact you um, in your relationship with her? In your relationship with other people? Uh, how did that happen? Yo, this is like, this is like a therapy session at this point. <laughs> so like, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's a lot that I've addressed over, over time. Right. Um, uh, how did it affect my relationship with my mom? Um, I think, I think that it made me actually, a, uh, in a, in a sense, a more caring person, more understanding, a more forgiving person. And it's, it's, that's actually usually the opposite of how people react yeah. to these things. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was also super, um, empathetic to my what my mom went through at least mentally um you know she blamed herself for a lot of stuff she didn't like herself when you don't like yourself there's a lot of other issues that we need to work through um you know in order to fix that and and so that's where her opioid addiction started was self-hate and that's why i actually talk about self-love now because i think we're all on some sort of journey to, to fully accept who we are um you know, how did it affect other relate? It affected other relationships more than it affected my mom's relationship. Uh, it certainly in my life and things that I've addressed, I mean, is it's, it's created trust issues for me at a younger age, um, which, which obviously 
weren't good for for girlfriends of mine um but at the same time you know i think that again it's the journey you have to learn you have to learn that people aren't perfect and you have to be accepting of that and um and just kind of leave it at that so my relationship with her it didn't affect that much i mean it made me grow up faster but at the same time it affected my other relationships which my therapist knows plenty about uh in, in negative ways so when you know with i go in a lot of homes where um more often than not, it's the child that, that mm -hmm. has, you know, the, the teenage kid or the, or the young adult that's got the opioid issue and the parents are having to, to deal with that. Um, but I have been in some, um, there's, you know, unfortunately, some that are still um, raising small children and, and whacked out on pills or whacked out on heroin. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing that, that lack of care, that lack of attention, the lack of responsibility that, that is, comes from feeding the addiction over feeding um, the love that your children need. Um, did you did you sense any of that with your mom, or was she pretty much a, a functioning mother who just happened to have an issue with opioids? Um, so a little bit of both. So, so like she was a functioning mom, you know, showed up. Um, I think it got older. It got worse as we got older. Um, so I wasn't always there, um, but she'd go through highs and lows, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think it was more of like, okay, I corrected it, now I'm going to relapse more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I think sometimes too, when you're living in it, you're not always aware all the time, if that makes sense. Like yeah. I think that when it's just part of your day to day, there's not, you're not always hypersensitive to certain things. Um, and you know, look, my sisters might say something different, but for me, like she was always supportive and loving and um, you know, whatever the case may be. So, uh, so a little, I want to say a little bit of both, but it was more of, she was, she was a great mom who happened to have an addiction. That's yeah. And I, I get that. And I think, you know, the, when you're in it and you're um, around it all the time, just like with anything, you, it becomes almost part of the norm. So therefore, it's not necessarily the thing you're paying attention to every day because it's yeah. always there. Um, so let's transition a little bit. Um, you know, I, I wanted to get the story behind you. I wanted to get a little bit as to what drives you, right? So yeah. it's, it's very clear that your relationship or lack thereof with your father and your mother or, or how that all that dynamic worked created the, the opinions, the thoughts, the the integrity, the, the authenticity, the heart of Justin. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we uncovered a little bit of that so people could see who you are um, other than just a podcast host or a speaker or an expert in, in business development. So right. when you, um, you started, you were at Cutco, right? And then mm -hmm. when you left Cutco, where did you go immediately after that? Yeah, so that's actually when I moved to Reading. So I had to leave Cutco when I moved to Reading uh, because – uh, I had to come here and help my mom with some stuff. And, and so from there, I actually ended up selling cell phones for a while. I did well with that. Uh, and then I got into marketing with a company. And then from there, I got into staffing for five years. So like I went through the basic, like figure out what you want to do with your life. Right. So I did staffing for five years. And then for five years, I worked for um, a medical device company. And then when I was there is when I started the podcast. Now, when you decided to come up with the pod, you said it was going to be an entrepreneur initially an entrepreneur podcast. Yeah. Um, what, what was the level of pod? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know enough about the, the, the evolution of podcasting as to when it became the ultimate way of sharing messages. What mm -hmm. was the timeline of when podcasting became um, something that everyone is starting to do? Yeah. So I started, uh, like I said, almost three years ago, it had just really begun. Like it just got to the point where people understood the power of it. But dude, look, like when I started it, I didn't understand it. I was just like, oh, I kind of liked this podcast. I think I could do that. It might be cool. Um, and so I started. So I think I was er definitely in the early stages. But to give you an example and people watching or listening, early stages meaning it's, it's blown up. In 2018, right, two 220,000 podcasts were launched in 2018. Wow. So it's become a humongous thing. Now, how many of those people make it through the weeds is a completely different story. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I think I got, I got involved pretty early on. Um, and I think that helped a little bit. I think that helped the growth and the opportunity. But my growth didn't really happen until it started getting flooded, which is kind of weird. And how did that, what was the, you know, obviously there's, um, you catch a wave, a lot of mm -hmm. times is that is that what happened do you, do you think you you caught a wave or were you already out in the water hanging out catching waves and then when it when the tsunami hit of everybody coming in you just sort of rose to the top 
Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was catching very, very tiny waves. So when I first started the show for the first 63 episodes, if people go and listen, uh, I had a co-host. And, you know, it was fine. We, we, were, we were doing better than average of what I know now. So the reality is 80% of podcasts that are out there do less than 100 downloads an episode. Um, and we were doing a little bit better than that. Not much better, uh, but we were doing a little bit better than that. And so, um, sorry, my, my phone just keeps doing weird stuff. Um, <laughs> And then what had happened was I asked, I asked my co-host to take a step back, mainly due to scheduling issues and stuff like that, but also because I wanted to kind of take the messaging a little bit more into the self-development. He was still kind of on the business side of things. And what happened was when I asked him to take a step back and I relaunched as just myself, the messaging and the branding started to really align. And then the people that were supposed to find my show found my show. And I started to have organic growth week after week. And like, I was like, at times I was like doubling my audience in a week. And I was like, what, I was like, what's going on? Um, and then all of a sudden the Inc. Magazine thing happened and I 4 x my audience overnight. So that was the big first wave that I caught. Um, and then I was speaking at events and they were giving me cool titles, like an icon of influence in the new media space. Um, so I think what it was, was a lot of consistent action for a long time. And then I happened to catch a wave. Um, and then I made all the right choices after that wave. Because I've, uh, after the ink thing, after the forex of the ink thing, I've actually um, then tripled my audience since then. Wow. And that's not relying on an article from two, two years ago. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, obviously there's, there's, a, there's a formula to success that obviously you're doing now as a business and you're, you're mm -hmm. helping people grow their podcast. And, um, you know, when you... Was it a, did somebody give you a hint or did somebody push you in the right direction and say, hey, Justin, you know, you're doing great. I love your show. I think if you did this, this would help. And then you started to figure out to unlock the code. I mean, my background's in Army intelligence. I decoded Russian code. I mean, I, I understand the value of, of trying to solve complex problems. Yeah. How did that, how did the, because it couldn't have just been you and your buddy started a podcast. Next thing you know, you're an ink magazine. Like, so <laughs> yeah. there had to be some, some level of, of directional movement that, that somebody from the outside probably gave you. Is that, was that yeah. true to say? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So what had happened was I decided to start surrounding myself with people that are in the podcast game. Um, you know, there's that saying, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So I started spending more time with people that were doing well and, and utilizing podcasts for other reasons. And I started to pick their brain and I, and, you know, I started to try some of the things they were telling me to do and some would work and some wouldn't. Um, and then I started to try my own things and it became a trial and error type of process. And then I found out what worked and I just did more of that. Um, but yeah, for sure. Like for me, it's all about who you're surrounding yourself with. Um, like when I speak on a stage about I, one of the talks I give are the five ways to grow your show. And the fifth way is you are, you know, your, your network is your net worth. So you have to surround yourself with the right people. It's why I run a podcast mastermind where there's podcasters that are together helping each other. It's not just me coaching. It's a team of people. It's about the people working together to try different things, to get on each other's shows. And, you know, I think from that standpoint with anything, I mean, now it's, now for me, it's business. Like I surround myself with some of the greatest business minds in the world. Um, and that's either through my podcast or I become friends with a lot of them. Uh, and I'm able to shoot them a text and go, Hey, I'm thinking this, what are your thoughts? And I get real honest responses. Um, so for me, yeah, I mean, it was definitely asking the right questions to the right people, um, you know, or just asking questions. Sometimes they're the, they're the wrong questions because I saw, thought one thing and I was completely wrong. Um, but, but for sure, man, I think uh, like anything, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're deciphering Russian code. You're going to be with other people that are doing it with you because you can help each other. Yep. That makes sense. And I, you know, I, I'm a, uh, I'm like you, I have trust issues. <laughs> Yeah. Um, inherently in my life, I've, I've always had them. Um, and it's, some are defensive mechanisms that, that keep me safe. And some are through, uh, just constantly being bombarded with other people's shit for 26 years as a cop. <laughs> it just, yeah. it just sort of forces you to, to be a little bit more cautious with, with life. Um, so I don't always ask for help and I, I do have my network of of trusted advisors who help me with a lot of things and, and they are very um, important in my life. Um, but I, you know, I, I know with, with your podcast, so I, I've obviously listened to your podcast quite a bit and I understand the level of, of influence you have with your podcast. What is your end game? What is your desire to, um, you know, at some point in time, you're going to hit a, a pinnacle and then you're going to say, okay, I need to have another challenge. Do you have it like a, 
the Growth Now Movement Mount Rushmore or the, <laughs> the, the Everest? Like, what are you trying to – what is your goal when you, when you had your vision? Yeah, so, you know, originally – if you look at my name, the Growth Now Movement, originally it's Growth Now, right? And so it was a journey for me first. I had to go through a lot. I had to fix those trust issues. I had to figure out what it is, what was my message? How did I stay true to that? Was I being authentic? Was I being real? Um, and that was the growth part of it. And that's the growth part that I'm still living today, right? How do I become better? How do I live a better life? Oh, I, I just made a mistake. How do I make that right? Um, so that was, that's the first part, Growth Now. The second part's the movement part. Um, and I believe a movement happens when you can get in the room physically with people. Uh, and that's where Growth Now Movement Live came from. And I was like, well, how do I deliver to people the same benefits that I have every single week by talking to these incredible people? And I was like, well, let's, let's create an event. Let's put something together where I bring in some of the top guests that I've had on my show to deliver to these people. And not only deliver, but be a part of the event. Not just speak and leave. Like, be a, really be a part of something and do a deep dive with the people that are there and help them with their business and then truly build that movement, right? So like my ultimate goal, my Mount Rushmore, uh, anybody who's watching that's in Reading, Pennsylvania, there's, a, there's an arena here um, called Santander Arena. And my ultimate goal at this point is to fill that, um, you know, to have a three or four day event that uh, fills that thing. And there's people from all over the world. You know, and this year one so far, um, I mean, I still have a lot more tickets to sell, but people are already coming from nine states in Canada to attend. Um, and so if I can see that grow, I would love to say one day there's people coming from nine countries or 10 countries um, that believe in the idea that, that um, we can continuously grow every single day to ensure happiness in our life. Because the end of the day, that's all we're chasing. All, every single conversation that I've had with these celebrities and billionaires and, and you know, massive influencers, they were all just chasing happy. They thought it was a thing at first, but it was all about how do I create the perfect happy life? Uh, and then we find that it's in the it's in the journey. It's not in the end goal. That's and that's cool because it it ties into. I, I had a speaking event this past weekend in Atlantic City, and um, I don't always remember what I say. <laughs> like it just sort of happens for an hour, and the next thing you know, I'm like, "What the hell just happened?" <laughs> um, so thank God it, it was videotaped. Um, yeah. So I was able to go back and listen to what I said, and some of it was really good. I'm you're like, "Oh, that wow!" I said that. I've been so, there, man. I know what you're talking about. So one of the. Uh, um, the things we talked about was because these are like, it was a, an advertising, that's a huge hand. Um, I know. I, I was, I was <laughs> trying to read the comment that popped up. In the face, dude. <laughs> in the face. Um, one of the things we talked about was why do we live our lives? What is, why are they living their lives? It was a, it was a room full of like late twenties, early thirties, advertising, marketing guys, um, all hungry, sales oriented. And I just wanted to know, like, you know, I told my brother's story and I wanted to know why they live their lives. Why, what is your goal in this life? And, and what it came out of it was the, the fact that none of it really is about us. It's about building a, a, a great enough story, a legacy that when you pass on, people can talk and continue to talk about you and finally reminisce about you and reference you and, and say, I learned that because of him or I'm here because of him or whatever, that's what life is. And, and if you're not living each day to try to create that, my end game is just to die the most popular, <laughs> amazing, influential person on the planet. It has nothing to do with anything else for me. And that's really all I strive for every day is how many yeah. people can I influence? Because I told a story about my brother, you know, he had never had anybody call our house and ask for him to come out and play. He never had anybody invite him over for a sleepover. He never was invited to a birthday party. Yet when he died, there was a thousand people in the church. Hmm. And I remember as cloudy as that was for me, because I was all effed up, I kept thinking to myself, who the hell are all these people? Yeah. And why are they here for my brother? And it turns out that every summer, my brother was in a camp. Uh, he went to a camp at work. He was uh, a friend of the family's, uh, ran this Christian camp. And he did cut grass and did odds and end tasks. But every summer he connected with the, the campers, the the staff, the parents of the kids, and they came back every year. And those were all the people that came to his funeral. And, and the relationship I had with my brother was different than anything that he was doing there. Like, I didn't know that person. Right. And and I just think that's so impactful. That, you know, my brother, who never had a single person call him to come out and play or invite him over, had a thousand people that said, I love you when he died. And I think mm -hmm. that's, for me, you know, when, when we're doing what we're doing, when we're, we're helping people, we're influencing people, we're sharing stories. I think that is, for me, 
what podcasting is about. That's what speaking is about. That's what mentoring kids is about. Yeah. What about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, man. So it's funny. Like you talk about end game, right? <clears throat> My end game is the same as your end game, which is the same end game of the 11 people that are watching now and the 20, 30, 40, 50 people that have come in and out. We all have the same end game and that's to die. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's it. The end of all of this is we're going to die. And then whatever you believe after that, whether that's to heaven, you, reincarnation, whatever you want to believe of where you go at or nowhere, whatever you want to believe, that's what happens after that, right? So our end game is all the same. And so for me, it's not even about, sure, I want to make an impact. That's why I have a podcast. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. But it's not thinking about that funeral. Um, you know, it's thinking about every single day that I live right now, am I truly happy? Like truly, like I can tell you this, I wake up every single morning really happy. Does that mean joyful? No, that's the biggest lie we've all been told, right? Um, because when we think that happiness is joy, happiness is that jumping up and down and whatever, that's not true. Like happiness is contentment. Happiness is understanding that we are exactly where we are supposed to be. Um, you know, happiness is driving towards some sort of purpose every single day, um, you know, Ha dude, I'm happy when I'm sad. I'm happy when I'm stressed. I'm happy when I'm angry. Uh, it's just a different feeling than what we're told when we were younger. Um, and so my ultimate goal, there is no end game, man. Like I said, I'm going to be dead. Um, so my ultimate goal is to just live happy. And hopefully along the way, I can bring some people along for the ride. That's cool. Yeah. And I think the, that, that definition of happy for me is I am, um, I'm appreciative of life. Like someone asks me all the time, I, I cry every time I talk about my brother. And they ask me why. It's been 30 years. Why does it still hurt that much? And I said, because if it didn't, then I didn't have, he's not with me anymore. Like mm. his memory isn't living inside of me anymore. If I can relive those moments so intensely that it brings that emotion back, then I'm happy as hell. Yeah. I'm sad that day. Like yeah. I appreciate the fact that I can still feel my brother's presence. And I appreciate that I can still feel all those things that I want to feel every day. And as long as I'm feeling those things, I'm happy. Even if, even if I'm sad, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like I appreciate those moments. For sure. For sure. So yeah. I mean, about, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, go, no, go ahead. Let's talk about your, uh, your event. You know, I, I'm really excited that, that, that you're having this event local. Um, but let's talk about that because I think one of the cool things you're doing and, and you've said it earlier is, is you're keeping it in Reading. You could easily take it to Philly or King of Prussia or, or, or any of the major places locally around here and mm -hmm. have a, uh, a much more uh, vibrant area to go to, but you're choosing to keep Reading alive and make Reading a place that everybody goes to. Tell me about that. Yeah, man, I think it, I think it goes, people ask me about that all the time. Like, why aren't you holding it in Philly or New York or Miami or wherever, you know, 10X conference is this week in Miami. Shout out to Grant Cardone. There's your plug. Um, but, you know, I want to hold it in Reading because I look at the city of Reading and the reason I've stayed here for 15 years with no family here. My family's still in South Jersey. The reason I've stayed here for 15 years is because when I look at Reading, I kind of feel like it's me in city form. What, here's what I mean by that. There, everybody said to me, there's no chance, kid. You've got no chance. And that's what people say about Reading. Mm -hmm. People go, you can't hold events in Reading. Reading can't get better. You, it's never going to become a thriving metropolis. And I went, watch it watch me be a part of that. Um, and so, yeah, is it a lot harder to sell tickets? Yup. Is it harder to explain to people, uh, yeah, there's no airport here. You're gonna have to fly into Harrisburg or Philly and then rent a car. Yep. But guess what? People are doing it from nine states in Canada right now. And I hope to, you know, next time I chat to somebody, I hope I, hope I say 10 states and three, three countries, right? Um, but the thing is, like, I think so often, we look at something and, and we go, uh, nobody ever else has done it or everybody says I can't do it. And you don't even try. Well, I'm going to try and I guarantee you I'm going to succeed. Um, and every single year I, I plan on doubling the attendance of this event. And I plan on it being a big part of the city and, you know, being able to look back and say, look, like I was, I was a part of that city's growth. I was a part of the reason that entrepreneurs started to move to Reading and build their businesses here. Um, you know, that, that happened, like I'm still here for a reason right? I'm still in Reading. People ask me all the time, why aren't you in San Diego with all the other podcasters? Uh, well, number one, it's really expensive, really <laughs> expensive. But number two, man, I, I want to be a part of something because I, you know, the city of Reading and what people say about it reminds me of how people felt about me when I was a kid. That's cool. I mean, I, I grew up in Pottstown, which is, you know, basically a small Reading. And yeah. uh, um, 
you know, we were rivals in high school and you know, I, you know, Danielle Marshall dunk on me in high school. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, I have a lot of connections. My dad and mom, my stepdad and mom live in, in uh, Exeter. My dad had a church on ninth street, ninth of Greenwich and Reading um, for many years um, before it closed. And so I'm very connected to the city of Reading myself. Um, obviously I do the work with the Reading high school basketball team. Um, yeah. So I, I appreciate Someone who says, I'm going to take the thing that nobody else believes in and I'm going to help. I'm going to do something great for it and then help the community bring money and bring, bring, you know, tourism, bring um, business, bring entrepreneurs into an area that, that right now is struggling. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, when I went to talk to Reading High School, one of the kids on the basketball team was just coming back from getting shot. And, uh, you know, I, that shouldn't happen. Yeah. Um, you know, walking down the street and a drive by. You know, that just shouldn't be happening. And it should be happening in Berks County, Pennsylvania, you know, um, but it does. And, yeah. and it's, it's something that if we can change the attitude, change the mindset, get people to believe in, in something a little bit, um, a little bit bigger than just the, the storylines you're reading in the newspaper. Um, I think that's something that can, can really impact. And I, I really do commend you for, for having that kind of um, long-term vision for the city of Reading. And I'm sure they will appreciate it. Yeah. And look, it's not just me. Right. And like, and I don't want to come across as pretentious. Like I'm going to be the savior of the city. Like I, all I am is a catalyst for the conversation because I have a podcast that happens to do well. I have an opportunity to do something really cool. Um, you know, the cool part is guys like Fabio Viviani from America's Top Chef, who runs a company that does $200 million a year, projected to do half a billion this year. Sarah Centrella, who's a best-selling author, is teaching people all over the world how to manifest their perfect life, like an actual X's and O's on how to do it. Um, you know, Albie Manzo from Real Housewives of New Jersey, my good friend Justin Cavanaugh, who is a top five speed and performance coach, Terry Weaver, who's just a killer man about creating – creating tribes and really growing and working together as a crew. Like it's about those people that I'm bringing in as speakers because they believe in that too. Like they didn't have to say yes. They get paid tens of thousands of dollars to speak on stages all over the, the world, all over the world. Like here's, here's the truth. I'm not paying any of them because they want to help. They want to be a part of something. Um, and to give you an example of like, okay, I'm not paying Fabio Viviani to come speak because I happen to be friends. I happen to become friends with him over the last year. He just, he was just in Oaks, Pennsylvania for an event. And the reason he showed up is because they bought $600,000 worth of his wine. <laughs> so I think, I think it's, I think it's just being about living in a good intention, being open with what you are trying to do. And I think your tribe will grow. And I think the people that are supposed to be in your life will be there and they'll want to give and they'll want to be a part of what you're doing as long as your intention is good. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's, um, there, there's something to say about, I have friends from all walks of life. <laughs> I have some that spend time in jail. I have some that are multi, multi-millionaires and I have just my, my, my people I grew up with. Yeah. And, and I have a test that what I expect in return is loyalty. What I expect in return is honesty. And what I re expect in return is trust. And when I, when I give you mine, I just expect it in return. And I've been very fortunate in that the people that I surround myself with have done all those things. And while they may not have an influence in my podcasting world, they sure do have an influence in making sure my, my son gets where he needs to be or my daughter has what she needs or my wife's car gets fixed or whatever the case might be that, that allows me to continue to grow and build my, my network through my business. So I totally agree with, with the things that you were just saying and, and how that, yeah. how important that is in your life. Yeah. And you give first, right. And, and yeah. I, so like, here's the thing I give without expectation. Um, I end every, almost every single conversation I have with how can I help you? What can I do for you? Um, and I can't always do it, but obviously if I have the opportunity to, I will, and I'll make connections and I'll see what I can do. And, um, and I do that with people that on God's honest truth, I expect them to go, you can't help me with anything because I've got everything. Um, but what I found is you can, like, you just got to figure out what it is you can give and give without e expectation. And the universe is a rule of reciprocity. Like if you give, you will receive, and you have to truly believe that's going to happen. And when I finally figured that part out, that's when everything started to flow. That's when the business grew. That's when Growth Now Movement Live became a reality. Um, and so, yeah, man, it's, it's just about giving without expectations. And I promise you um, that good will come of it. That's what you say. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually um, exactly what's happened to me this year. 
So when I, when I created I Got You, my company for public speaking, the tagline is living a life of selfless service worthy of remembrance. Um, and John Cain, my man from Cutco and yeah. Vector Marketing, he actually, his question and answer, wrote that down on a napkin after we were talking about what I wanted to do. And, and he wrote that down and said, this is who you are. And, and, and it's true, you know, that I got you meaning and then also what, what I want out of my life and what, what I want that to mean. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I, I've been pushing the rock uphill for the last year, working 100 jobs, working 100 hours a week, and if I outwork everybody, it will come. And what I realized is that I was putting expectations on myself with time tables, saying if I don't have this done by this time, I'm a failure. If I don't have this done by this time, I'm a failure. And in December, I made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to do that anymore. I was going to stop putting those timetables on, on my life, and I was just going to simply be and do and enjoy and be in, embrace the process of growing this and doing all the stuff I was doing anyway, but not doing it with that expectation of, of if it's not done by June, I'm screwed. Yeah. And, and it's been so liberating for me, and I've seen so much more growth out of my effort and what that produces. Um, it's been amazing. So, yeah, I, I completely agree with the universe. And I agree with, with mindset. And I agree with just letting yourself live and, and, and be part of and present in what's going on. Yeah. And that's, and that's it. Like we can't live with expectations. The reality is we can all, we talk about how we all have the same end goal and that's death. My end goal could be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so I better damn well enjoy today because it might be, that's all, that, that might be all we have. Like you and I lost people suddenly. So we understand that probably more than most. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sometimes that creates the opposite effect and you start to bury your head down and work your butt off. And I have to get to this thing that I've created in my head. that's not even real and whatever else, but it's about understanding, enjoying today and working for a better tomorrow. You're, we, we can expect tomorrow it might not happen, but we can expect it and work for a better tomorrow. But if we're enjoying the heck out of what we're doing, man, that's all that matters. So I love that. So thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate that, man. Well, I'm going to, we're going to close the show because, uh, you know, we're only coming up on the hour, even though uh, we started a little bit late. <laughs> um, and I know you've got stuff to do, um, but I do appreciate you being on the show. I know that, uh, you know, you, you're asked to do a lot and, uh, you know, it's not often that a guy with 60 downloads per episode mm -hmm. gets a guy that's got, you know, 300,000, whatever episode downloads you get <laughs> uh, every month. But um, I do appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you're, you support me and I support you. And if, if I can help with the reading component um, and, and doing whatever it is you want to do and helping you with the growth uh, now movement live, um, I'm in, um, like I said, I was just waiting to hear back on a, my event, which is not going to be now. And at the same time as yours, because I can't seem to find a high school venue that will do it with me, but uh, mm. it's going to come soon, but yes, I'll it will for event. And uh, you know, I just, I appreciate you uh, being on. Yeah, man, for sure. For sure. Look, if anybody's watching now or listening that want, they want to go to the event, go to gnmlive.com. Get your tickets. Super affordable. Would love to have you guys there. Like Matt said, he'll be there as well. So connect with him, you know, brainstorm with him, work with him. Um, you know, I, I think more than anything, I said yes to this show because I, I believe in your, your mission. I believe in your message. I believe in what you're building. Um, and I want to be a part of it as best I can. And this is the first way, right? Yep. Uh, and so, you know, let's see what else we can do together, man. I just appreciate you. So thank you so much. All right, brother. Well, everybody, thank you. I know this was not the uh, standard way that we do our show, uh, <laughs> but thank God we improvise, adapt, and overcome. Uh, this was another edition of Two Dates in the Dash podcast. My name is Matt Kubler. I'm your host. And thank you again to my very special guest, Justin Shank. Um, and for God's sakes, everybody, let's go out and live lives to the best of our ability. Be happy and be kind to one another. God bless. Take care.